David Graham is a speaker, author, businessman, former pastor, and founding director of Youth with a Mission Montana. He is also the author of the song, In Moments Like These. This song appropriately describes this podcast, which is a short, biblically-based, and encouraging devotional influenced by David's lifetime of personal moments. These moments are shared with a heart to encourage and inspire you to see Him, our Heavenly Father, at work in your own moments. I know this is David's heart in sharing because he has spent my lifetime speaking hope and encouragement into my own heart. If you would, take a few minutes and listen today. I am really proud of the things that he has done throughout his life, but what I am most proud of and grateful for is for the kind of dad, daddy, he has been to me. About four years ago, I met some very interesting new friends. They have little wings, and they fly to me, and they land on me. Nearly every day, I will get personal visits from chickadees and nuthatches as I do yard work around our home, which sits next to a forest on a hillside in northwest Montana. Sometimes the little birds will land on my shoulder. If I'm sitting, sometimes they will land on my knees. A number of times, as I was using my cell phone, one of them has landed on my phone and then stared down at the screen to see what I was looking at and they will always wait patiently until I take some unsalted raw peanuts out of my pocket and let them land on my hand. Then they will fly off into the forest to eat or store their little treasure. Oh, to be able to fly. Oh, to be free as a bird. I'm sure you've heard the saying, to be free as a bird. Now, I'm by no means a bird expert, but of one thing I'm pretty certain, Birds are not blissfully free. First, regarding the joy of flying, I'm pretty convinced that flying isn't all fun and games to these little creatures. It appears to be far more work for them than fun. All of them will completely disappear as strong winds pick up. Even when it's calm out, I'm quite sure that flapping those little wings for hours on end can be as tiring to them as running for hours on end can be to us. But they do it because they have to. They fly to survive. Another thing that I've observed is that the same birds fly to me every day throughout the year. The experts say that these species will live year-round in small groups, a dozen or so, and restrict themselves to very small areas, like the area immediately around our home. I think of their small familiar area as sort of a survival camp because birds are clearly all about safety and survival. Birds definitely understand the pecking order. The most dominant birds feed first while the subdominant birds wait before feeding and all of them are constantly on guard against predators. Still, even after all their guardedness, it's sometimes not enough. Only yesterday I was shocked and saddened at the sight of a small hawk that made a high dive out of nowhere to steal an unsuspecting little chickadee from off a high branch, and without breaking its speed, the hawk continued to fly away with it. All that to say, I think it's an illusion to think that birds are somehow free. They are not. They are challenged survivors. I also believe it is an illusion to think that we humans are free either. Remember that I read this in an earlier episode from 1 John 5:19. The whole world is now, or currently, under the control of the evil one. In an effort to avoid the evil one's hostile domination, we humans also tend to adopt a survivalist mentality. We too tend to gravitate into unhealthy survival camps. I'm sure there are more, but here are three camps that I recognize. The first one I call Camp Independent. This camp is made up of those who want to steer clear of people in general, retreating into more private and non-conformist lifestyles. The second camp I call Camp Victim. 
It's made up of members whose objective is to lay low, follow the line of least resistance, and avoid a fight at all costs. He or she finds some strange sense of identity and security by adopting the profile of being the forever victim. The last camp, well, I call that one the camp of the bully. Although there are varying types of bullies, the main objective of the members in this camp is to be more powerful, to survive by being the fittest, to dominate rather than be dominated. Human history provides us with unlimited examples of those who lean toward the bully side. One of my past favorites was Muhammad Ali, the three-time heavyweight champion of the world. Like any good bully, he loved to taunt his opponents, both in and out of the ring. I actually kind of liked the guy, but not as much as he liked himself. He will go down in boxing history not only for being the greatest, but for saying he was the greatest on many occasions. I heard an interesting story about Ali, which took place during his heyday, that demonstrates the deception of bullyism. As the story goes, the champ, on his way to do battle, was sitting in the first class section, where else, of a plane that was just moving into his takeoff position. As the big DC-10 turned to begin its charge down the runway, the flight attendant kindly but firmly said to the champ, Mr. Ali, sir, you don't have your seat belt on. Always known to be quick on his feet, he retorted with a smile of genius on his face. Uh, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. The sweet attendant, even quicker on her feet, said, But Mr. Ali, sir, Superman doesn't need an airplane. The moral of the story? Even the best of bullies, even the greatest of all time, has his limitations. They may have the power to dominate for a season at a certain level, but sooner or later, the nature of dependency and susceptibility will deliver them up to an unfriendly, more powerful force. Death, for example, as I said before, has a very convincing way of dominating even the biggest bully. All three of these survival camps are adequately represented within the religious world, too. It's come as a surprise to many I've talked to over the years especially those who have been subjected to strict legalism or religiosity, that being in a place of dependence upon God is not about being controlled or dominated. Many Christians haven't understood, therefore haven't enjoyed the very essence of Christianity. Far too many good people faithfully sing the hymns, heed the rules or try to, bless the food and pay the tithes, more out of a sense of duty rather than out of a joyful response to a loving Heavenly Father. Many are further confused by a misconception that God is primarily a judge who isn't very loving at all. These good people continue to experience insecurity and insignificance as they struggle to find both in one of the survival camps. Outside the Garden of Eden, humans were faced with a challenge to survive, and the challenge to feel significant again. What on earth's the matter? What happened in Eden anyway? Let's recall the temptation recorded in Genesis 3, verse 5, where the serpent said, When you eat of it, the fruit, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. I call this line hell's horrendous hoax. As I said earlier, I believe that it's through dependence upon a perfect mutuality with the Heavenly Father that one experiences the greatest in human beingness. So then what did happen in Eden? On a catastrophic day in the garden, think about this, in a single moment that perfect bond with their father was suddenly broken. Broken because a lying diabolical power appeared to God's children and tempted them to cross over the safe borders of their mutuality, convincing them that by taking a position of independence, they would be much better off and would gain much greater significance, that they would be as significant as God himself. Have you ever wondered why Satan did this? 
It was because he wanted God's children to lose what he had lost. And what had he lost? The mutuality he once had with God. And now, out of his anger and jealousy, Satan was purposely prodding the children to join him in his own misery, where they would not only keep him company, but also experience his dominating abuse. And the very first sign of his dominating abuse, after the children lost their bonded relationship with God, Genesis 3 verse 7 says, they suddenly realized they were naked. In other words, they felt ashamed of themselves. What happened in Eden? Adam and Eve had tragically shifted their dependence away from their perfect mutuality to a very dark one. They traded the very best relationship for the very worst, the most loving one for the most hostile. And from that time on, the hostility has never stopped. Not for a day, not for an hour, not for a moment. So, what on earth is the matter? Mutuality, the most important link to life, is missing. The children of all ages everywhere need their father. Dear friend, let me summarize all this to make it easier to understand. Unlike a judge who will coldly judge you and then sentence you, please begin to imagine God as a loving father. Think of him saying something like this to you. When you're feeling guilty for something and you're groveling down in the dust, feeling shame for something you've done, imagine seeing him and hearing him say this as he stretches his hand down to help lift you up. Hear him say, my son or my daughter, we don't do that in our house. Rise up. My friend, I have wonderful news for you. You don't ever have to live in a survival camp again. You don't ever have to wonder about your significance and well-being again. The great King and Savior Jesus has made a way for you to live again with the Father of Eden, the Father in Heaven. All you have to do with your own free will is leave the survival camp you've been living in. Leave your baggage behind and go back home to your father's house. Jesus, thank you. You made us feel free again. Bring or renew that free feeling into this one's life. Father, you make us feel safe and significant again. Bring or renew those real feelings into this one's life and give this one life to the full. Let it be. You've been listening to In Moments Like These with David Graham. If you'd like to contact David or find out more information about In Moments Like These, please visit InMomentsLikeThese.com.